Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Elisa Flowers. Uh, I currently serve as the Director of Student Life and Leadership, um, and I will allow my co-hosts to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Vincent Vigil, and I serve as the Senior Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and your Dean of Students. Um, so I am honored to be here today to talk about free speech and your organization. And if you all could take time to use the QR code to sign in so that we can uh, take attendance and verify that you did attend your LeadCon sessions, that would be great. Give folks a few seconds to do that. And then if you're unable to use the QR code, there's a link in the chat that you can use as well to sign in. Cool. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So today, uh, Dr. V. Hill and I are going to be discussing uh, a student affairs approach to free speech. And this is an introduction and orientation session for our student organizations. Uh, today's learning outcomes uh, at the end of the session, we anticipate that you will be able to summarize important elements and aspects of the First Amendment and how they relate to student free speech activities articulate university policies and procedures related to free speech, and recall strategies used for student free speech activities. You'll be quizzed on all that at the end, I'm just kidding. Um, so our agenda today, uh, Dr. V is going to start out by talking about the First Amendment, then we'll talk specifically about our university policies here on campus, um, and we'll describe kind of our uh, procedures and strategies that we use uh, to monitor and manage free speech activities here. And then we'll open it up to questions if y'all have any. All right, so I'll get us started here talking about the First Amendment. So we could spend an entire retreat, an entire weekend, an entire week talking about the First Amendment and analyzing the First Amendment. Um, but we just wanted to give you a little tidbit, a little piece of the First Amendment here. We're not going to go into it in depth. I'm sure some of you have taken some constitutional classes or some legal classes or just some classes that talked about the law or um, you know, just the, the amendments that we have in our constitution. Um, so this is just a little um, preamble um, to the First Amendment. So Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So basically, we are fortunate here in the United States of America to have the First Amendment because we are able to speak our minds when it comes to anything that maybe we don't necessarily agree with, right? We have seen in different countries that maybe that is not feasible. Um, we've also seen that in different countries where maybe um, COVID or the pandemic was used as a way to restrict speech or restrict activism. And so here within the United States, we don't do that and we abide by the First Amendment. Next slide. So why is free speech important? Freedom of speech is essential to freedom of thought, right? So we want to have that opportunity to say what we want to say and to say what's on our minds. It is essential to democratic self-government and the alternative um, government censorship and control of ideas. So that is not what we are about here um, within the United States. We wanna make certain that we don't censor and that we don't control ideas. And so that's why free speech is important for us. Next slide. So there are two resources here that Elisa and I wanted to share with you all. These are resources that we use as student affairs professionals when it comes to free speech issues on our campus. The first one is Free Speech on Campus. Um, it is written by Edwin Shimerinsky. He is the former dean of the UC Irvine Law School. He is now the dean of the Berkeley Law School. And so he wrote this book with the chancellor at UC Irvine, Howard Gilman, and they use different examples. They have um, different um, perspectives about free speech and how to handle these things. Um, but they basically go through and talk about what are some issues that colleges need to think about and negotiate when dealing with free speech issues on a college campus. 
The second book is The First Amendment on Campus. This is a handbook for college and university administrators. It's put together by NASPA. And NASPA is a student affairs um, entity that it brings, it's our professional society, that brings us all together within student affairs. And so this is a simple read. Um, they have a lot of different um, case studies in here, different examples. Um, both books are available within Student Life and Leadership, or you can also look them up in the library and they should be available. But if you have any, any desire to learn more about free speech on college campuses, these are two great books to refer to. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Elisa to talk about university policies. So the guidance that we use um, on our campus for free speech activities, uh, we have a few things that we use. The first is the First Amendment. Um, again, that was um, a very kind of short introduction um, to how we utilize um, the First Amendment on our campus and, and how we determine what, what folks can and cannot say on our campus. Um, the second is the President Directives number five, and that is administrative guidelines regarding freedom of expression and expressive conduct. Um, there is a link provided um, that if you'd like to go online and look it up, I am going to go over um, some of the elements of that president's directive uh, in the next couple slides. Um, that president's directive really focuses on time, place, and manner. Um, and these are really the kind of guiding principles that we use to determine uh, whether an activity can happen at, at a particular time of day or um, kind of what else is going on um, to determine if it's an appropriate time for that activity to occur. Um, the next is venue reservations as student organizations. Um, you'll likely be putting in a lot of requests for venue organizations. Um, the Department of Student Life and Leadership specifically oversees many of our outdoor venue reservations um, like Titan Walk, uh, Tuffy Lawn, um, the um, ECS lawn, those types of things, the quad. Um, so those uh, venue reservations are done through Titan Link, and, and that is also um, how you get access to hosting an event or a free speech activity on campus. Um, and the last is our amplified sound policy, uh, which we have updated uh, quite recently. So I'll talk a little bit about the amplified sound policy and some of the updates that we've made to that document. So time, place, and manner. Uh, the constitutional guarantee of free speech from government restraint does not preclude reasonable restrictions unrelated to content. The Supreme Court recognizes in its opinions that the constitutional guarantee is not absolute. Time, place, and manner restrictions are content neutral limitations imposed by the university on expressive activity. I really want to focus on the idea of content neutral. Um, and so lots of things happen on our campus. If you've ever been outside, um, like around noon in the quad area, uh, we do tend to have uh, off-campus folks that show up and want to express themselves um, or express their point of view. And the way that we manage, um, manage those types of activities on our campus, it's very important that we're content neutral uh, when we address these situations. Um, and that is because, of the First Amendment, right? So we have to be very mindful um, that we're focusing on content neutral parameters and that's how we manage what is appropriate or inappropriate as far as time, place and manner. Um, and so for instance, time, uh, it could include designations on the length, frequency or time that such activities occur. It must be reasonable and appropriate. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our um, amplified sound policy. So if you see folks in the quad that have like a microphone or bullhorn or anything like that, um, amplified sound uh, is between the hours of 12 to 1. If there is um, an event occurring before 12 or after 1 o'clock, um, those, those types of events or that request has to be placed. Um, and we have to work with our campus partners and our academic partners to make sure that that amplified sound is not disruptive of the academic mission of the university. Um, so that's a way that we use time to manage kind of what's happening or what's occurring on campus. Um, the place, it could include specific, uh, specifications on the areas of campus that can be used. 
uh, including those that require a reservation or impede on fire lanes. And so if a student organization has an event booked in the quad um, on a Tuesday from 12 to two o'clock, uh, and someone, someone else shows up and, and tries to have an event in their space, we can ask them to reserve that space at a different time um, because it's already been approved for a specific event to occur in that area. So folks can't just show up and impede on the, the event that you already have going on. Um, they have to be respectful um, and either put in it for another time or date or another location. Um, so that's really important as far as venue reservations. Um, when there are speakers out in the quad area, um, I'll talk a little bit about how my staff and my colleagues help manage that. Um, what we will often do though, what really is important is keeping the fire lanes um, open. Um, we cannot block fire lanes, not for any type of event. Um, so anytime there is a big event on campus, like for instance, like our department hosts Discover Fest, which is a huge event. We have to get special permission. We have to get um, special permission from the fire marshal in order to have any type of event that might be blocking a fire lane. Um, because what if we block fire lanes, then emergency vehicles can't access the space. Um, if there's an event that may block fire lanes, we have to get that approved. Uh, so that the fire marshal knows how to enter and exit the campus based on what's occurring. Um, so folks cannot block fire lanes. So oftentimes you'll see myself or another student affairs professional that um, might say like, hey, um, you all are blocking the fire lanes. I can't have you in this particular area. Um, the last element that we use to determine the appropriateness of free speech activities uh, is manner. So it doesn't limit content, uh, but instead it relates to the form of communication. So like for instance, the volume, um, we cannot affect um, or disrupt the academic mission of the university. So that's when I talked about amplified sound. So using amplified sound only between the hours of 12 to one. Um, and we've also um, identified some additional um, mitigation measures in order to not disrupt the academic of the uh, academic mission of the university, which I, I'll talk about. In the next slide, please. So venue reservations are done through our Titan Link system. Um, so I know that there was a session earlier uh, on Titan Link. I'm pretty sure that that's been recorded. So if you have questions about how to reserve venue spaces, it, you can watch that session or go on Titan Link and put in that request. Uh, registered student organizations and campus departments with approved reservations for venues have priority over that venue space. Um, so if an organization is already approved to host an event at a certain time uh, in a certain location, an off-campus or, or another guest can't just show up and, and take over that space. It's already been approved for, for your event. Um, if you ever are hosting an event and you show up and there is someone else there, you can contact the Student Life and Leadership Office. Um, and then um, we can work with that um, with the other entity to ask them to, to leave the space. Um, you also are given confirmation um, when you reserve a space. So you could show that to the individual or to the other group, like, hey, we have this time and date already secured. Um, free speech activities should not use a reserved venue. They're encouraged to use non-reserved campus venue space. Um, so if we have an off-campus guest that would like to come on campus and, and express, use expressive content, um, then we typically would prefer that they use an open space that's not reserved. Um, our re reserved spaces, we really try to prioritize for our student organizations and our campus events. Um, if event coordinators require support, you can always call us at Student Life and Leadership and there's our office number, or you can come by and let us know um, if somebody's in the space that you already have reserved. Um, our amplified sound policy is approved from 12 to 1. So that's typically when you're out on campus, you'll hear like more music. Maybe you'll have people with a microphone, different things like that. Um, any Anything that's before 12 or after 1 does need special permer permission. Um, and an organization or an off-campus entity can email us and ask for that special permission. Um, but if it's before 12 or after 1, that is reserved for campus departments, um, registered student organizations, or university-sponsored events. Um, and what we've done with the amplified sound policy is also identified areas of campus in which you can have amplified sound. Um, and so most of those areas are going to be um, in like the central quad, 
um, or the inter tuffy lawn or potentially intramural fields. Um, so we are trying to minimize um, some of the areas where we were getting lots of concerns and complaints about uh, the noise level interrupting the academic mission of the university. So we're trying to make sure that we uh, prioritize and not impeding upon the academic mission of the university. Um, approved uh, sound exemptions for campus departments or university events. Um, we will share with neighboring colleges to let them know, like if there's a university event that um, is has amplified sound after one o'clock, so that way we can work together to make sure that we're not disrupting classrooms. So procedures and strategies that we use um, on our campus. So the quad squad. Um, so oftentimes if there is any activity, um, typically like in the quad or Titan walk, um, usually it is off campus guests, um, but not always. Um, you will see the quad squad. And so that's comprised of student affairs professional staff members uh, who are led and trained by the Office of Student Life and Leadership who monitor outdoor free speech activities uh, that could be coordinated by uh, students, registered student organizations, or a campus visitor. Um, it was granted the name Quad Squad since many of the activities happen in Central Quad. Uh, student life, and we're also available um, for consultations on how to handle free speech activities at indoor student events. And Dr. V will talk a little bit about um, some measures that can be placed um, in for indoor events. Um, you will see us out there. I'm sure in spring, uh, we're going to order some orange visors so that we're easily identifiable. Um, for our students and also our campus partners. So what types of events do, does Quad Squad respond to? Uh, so it could be a non-CSUF visitor. Um, so that could be any external person. It could be like the preachers or petitioners that are in the squad. It could be guest speakers or someone else. Um, it could be a registered student organization. So sometimes our registered student orgs want to host rallies or marches or speakers on campus. Um, and so we'll help monitor those events as well. Um, or it could be a non-registered student group. So any group of CSUF students that say, hey, we wanna bring a speaker or we wanna have a march, um, we can help with those consultations and help monitor and um, monitor those events as well. And the approach uh, that we use really is crowd monitoring. So um, oftentimes it says more than 50, but usually if there's about 25 to 30 or a crowd is gathering, um, someone from the student life and leadership staff um, will go out and just kind of monitor what's happening um, and keep all of us kind of abreast on um, the number of people in the crowd, uh, if folks are highly agitated or just kind of listening. Um, should the activity cause students to indicate experiencing extreme distress or adverse reactions? Um, at that time, we will refer the student to appropriate resources, depending on um, kind of what's happening and what the student's, student needs in that moment. Um, our goal really is to keep the audience about 25 feet away from the speaker. Um, it's always in our students' best interest uh, if we put some space between them and the speaker. Uh, if the audience doesn't abide by that request, um, typically the approach is our quad squad or our student, um, student affairs professionals uh, will stay closer to the speaker. Um, oftentimes, if students are upset, um, visibly upset or angry about the content that's being expressed. Um, if we stand closer to the speaker, it tends to kind of help diffuse the situation because the students aren't mad at us. Um, they are upset with what's being said. Um, and so oftentimes we'll kind of stand closer to the speaker to diffuse what's happening. Um, and also so that the student, student feels um, less angry, honestly, <laughs> when we're in those situations. Um, the other important thing is when you when you see that occurring or you see a crowd building, the audience, uh, the speaker will only stay as long as they have an audience. Um, so oftentimes we'll always ask students like, are you missing class for this? Like, is there somewhere else where your time would be better spent? Um, if the audience leaves, the speaker leaves. Um, there's no point in them being there if, if no one is kind of listening to what's occurring. Um, so we always remind students like, you know, there are other things they could be doing on campus as opposed to engaging with um, with expressive content that um, is not helpful for them or truthful for, for them. 
So Dr. V will talk about uh, procedures. All right, so procedures, quad squad procedures. So um, when it comes to managing the quad squad, we try to use four different techniques. Um, one of them is to inform. So student life and leadership is informed about a visitor that comes on campus. Usually sometimes we get a phone call or someone stops by the student life and leadership office. Um, at that time, we have somebody from the student life and leadership um, department go and talk to that visitor and remind them that there are certain expectations when it comes to time, place, and manner that they must abide by. Then we assess the situation. So student life and leadership um, staff will go out there and look at the situation and see the crowd and see what's going on. We'll assess for the size. We'll assess for whether or not um, where the area is. And then just looking at the situation overall. The next step is we will notify. So we have a text message chain that we're in with PD, myself, and then Elisa, and we'll notify each other of any sort of text updates that are going on when it comes to that particular situation. Um, we'll constantly remind the visitor or the event coordinator that there are expectations. So if we think that they are towing the line on expectations, we'll remind them exactly of what they can and cannot do. Then we take action. So student life and leadership staff will monitor the visitor um, will look at the event and will request additional staff if needed. So we'll ask for more staff members to come on out and help us monitor that particular situation. Um, we may ask PD to come out. Um, if they do come out, then they will stay a little bit away from the situation for us, um, but they may provide any sort of additional assistance as needed. So indoor event considerations. Um, Elisa talked about time, place, and manner when it comes to free speech activities. Um, and Elisa talked about it in the context of being outside, right? Um, being out in the quad, for example. Um, I'm gonna give you some examples when it comes to an indoor event because some of your organizations sponsor indoor events as well as outdoor events. And so when it comes to indoor events, once you promote your event on social media for everyone to know about, that means that it's an open invitation for everyone to come. So just think about everyone who is following you on social media and sees your organization sponsoring a particular event or meeting. That means that everyone who's following you may come to that particular event. That could be people that are pro kind of what your event stands for or also against what your event stands for. So just remember that once you put it out into the social media world, that people may be coming to your event that you may not expect to. So when it comes to time, it's important for you to think about that there is some sort of schedule that you put together um, when it comes to your particular event. So maybe there's an agenda um, that you have and that when your visitors are there, you remind them and say, this is our agenda of what we're gonna do today um, and reminding them to stay within that agenda. Um, also, you may have people that want to express their viewpoints about the particular topic that's being expressed at your event, right? They may, may be for it, they may be against it, but we often encourage you to allow a time for people to express their viewpoints. So maybe having a QA and a um, or maybe making certain that when people are able to ask questions that there's like a two minute limit for questions. Um, just some strategies to kind of control the situation um, within that indoor event. Um, when it comes to place, it's important for us to think about the location of where the event is taking place. So if it's an auditorium style, if it's a circle, um, if you do have any sort of visitors that are maybe want to express their viewpoints against the topic that you're talking about, then you might want to set up the room a little bit differently, right? Um, if those visitors, for example, are holding signs up um, and they're in the front row of an auditorium style seating, then they're impeding on the view of the people behind them. And so then you're going to have to ask those particular individuals to lower their signs. Or if they don't want to lower their signs, they could probably stand in the back of the room and raise their signs because they won't be impeding on anyone's um, view of your event. So there are different things that you need to think about. Also, blocking walkways or accessibility ramps is not okay. So you may have to remind those visitors that, hey, you know, we have to keep the walkways open um, for people coming in and out. There is a particular manner when it comes to indoor events that we must consider. Um, you know, uh, Lisa talked about amplified sound. When you're in an indoor event, probably amplified sound for uh, someone who is against or wants to express their viewpoints isn't the best thing to do, right? If you have a bullhorn in a smaller TSU room, it's probably very difficult for you to continue your event. Now they're disrupting the event. They've taken it to another level. So you have to make certain that you remind your visitors that 
you know, we can't have amplified sound here. This is a small event. Um, if you do, you're interrupting the event. Um, so just things for you to consider, right? Time, place, and manner for an indoor event. And then next slide. So here are some university resources um, when it comes to providing any sort of support or if you want to just have people that want to file a report, um, they can also talk to university police. They could call, file that report um, if there's a physical altercation or a threat. News media, oftentimes we get protesters and we get a lot of news coverage that comes um, because maybe that protester does the rounds to different campuses. Um, they may be coming to UC Irvine right after they visit us. Um, if news media is out there, you as a student, you don't need to feel pressured to comment. So you can always direct them to strategic communications. And if there's anyone who's angry, upset, and they're a student, they could call the Dean of Students. Um, if it's a staff member, they can call Student Affairs. And if it's a faculty, they can call the Provost Office. Responding to free speech activities on campus. And so Elisa and I will take this slide together. Um, often we get the question about how can I and my organization respond? The most effective course of action is to, um, you know, think about the speaker and not really making any sort of spectacle as Elisa mentioned. Um, the longer you stay and watch them, then the longer they're gonna stick around on our campus. And then also the longer that they're going to come and visit our campus for, right? They just might come for a day and they're going to leave. But then now that they have 150 people waiting out there looking at them, they're going to come back tomorrow. So you thought you were upset about that speaker coming that one day. Now that they got an audience, they're coming back the next day, right? And so you have to really think about, you know, am I going to sit here? Am I going to listen to this? Is there something a little bit more proactive I can do? And I think Elisa could mention some great proactive things that you can do. Yeah. And this is a quote uh, straight from the Southern Poverty Law Center. I've included their uh, website at the bottom if you'd like to go on and check it out. Um, they have some very good um, ways of just kind of describing how you can respond uh, to free speech activities that maybe you don't agree with. Um, so one of the things um, that student organizations can do is you can speak out uh, against the event. Um, you can raise awareness if there's a counter narrative by hosting your own event. Uh, you can organize a joyful and peaceful protest away from the event, right? So again, just as the quote says, uh, what they're looking for is a spectacle. And if you don't give it to them, there's no reason for them to continue coming to the campus. Um, above all, avoid confrontation with the speaker and any of, any of the supporters. Uh, we really want our students to be able to attend class, um, go to their events and host events on campus that resonate with, with their ideologies um, and just be able to um, provide a counter narrative if, if they have one. Um, and so these are all ways that your organization or you can respond uh, if you disagree with a free speech activity that is occurring on our campus. And then when it comes to uh, hateful feelings, right? Um, sometimes there's speech that expresses hateful feelings. And we hear this a lot when we're monitoring some of these um, activities that are happening. Um, we hear hate speech, right? And so what does hate speech sounds like? It basically offends or insults groups based on race, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, disability, and other traits. Um, they are words that are hurtful, emotionally harmful, and psychologically stunning. So we hear that a lot from people about like what can we and cannot do when it comes to free speech. Um, and so often the question that we get is, is hate speech legal? Like these people are saying these mean things about, you know, these protected classes and they're saying these things out here. Are they, do they have a right to be out here? And the response is yes, they do. Um, they do have a right to be out there. Um, hate speech is legal. Um, we have heard in past political elections, hate speech being used um, against particular individuals. And those politicians were not taken to jail because of that, right? Um, and there is a difference uh, between a hate crime, which is a crime that is committed against somebody based upon the protective classes, right? And then also hate speech. So that is just speech that they are saying. So the hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. Um, and so it is allowed on our campus. And 
we understand it is hurtful. We understand that it can be psychologically stunning, um, but it is it is allowed. So one of the things that when we educate our colleagues or students or whoever it might be um, is really understanding kind of um, what you're capable of, right? And so standing in these spaces and listening to the rhetoric um, that if, if it is harmful to you or to people that are close to you or people that you love, um, find another place to have your um, identity celebrated and validated as opposed to standing and listening to um, somebody say otherwise. So um, you all know kind of what you're capable of um, when you're in those spaces, when you're walking across campus, when you hear those things. Um, some people can are able to digest more of it. Some people are like are immediately um, impacted by the words that are said. Um, and so it's really, really important to kind of know what your threshold is um, and kind of what is what is becoming harmful to you or to those or your friends or whoever you're supporting at the moment um, and just being aware of that. Um, also, don't personalize the content of the speech. Um, a lot of these, um, especially off-campus visitors that come to our campus to, um, to express uh, different opinions and ideologies, they are very well informed about um, how much they can say, what they can say, um, and kind of where the line is, where something becomes a threat. Um, so they know how to toe that line. Um, they know that they can't um, what they can and can't say. Um, so it's really, really important not for you not to personalize that speech. They are intentionally saying things that they know um, are legal. Um, take the time to decompress, de-stress, discuss. Um, hopefully um, all of y'all have some place on campus or someone on campus. Um, if you do not, we can always uh, refer you to a CAPS counselor. Um, and we can walk you over or one of our colleagues can walk you over um, if there's no one at the moment um, that you have to kind of de-stress and kind of discuss uh, what's occurring, especially if you have been um, negatively impacted um, or are really feeling um, really feeling harmed by what's being said. Um, I think it's also really important, especially for our student organizations, to remember and encourage uh, the positive outcomes of free speech. Um, and so Kyle, if you could go to the next slide, I have one um, slide that I wanted to show you. Student activism is free speech too. Um, and so a lot of uh, the movements that we've seen in this country and the, um, the laws that we've been able to appeal um, have come from student activism, which is also free speech. So um, I always tell students, you know, free speech works both ways. So if you have a counter narrative or you have something to share, um, let's organize an event around what you believe. Um, and how you would like to see either your campus or country or community move forward. Now we have a video that we'll show you. I think if you click on that, Kyle, it should play. I think we need to, is the volume, volume working? Mm -mm. Did you say something? Um, the volume isn't playing. Oh. You have to do share sound, maybe. Cal State Fullerton has always been and must. Cal State Fullerton has always been and must always be a marketplace of ideas. Can you hear it now? Yes, yep, we can I can hear. hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cal State Fullerton has always been and must always be a marketplace of ideas in which diverse perspectives from all sides of every issue are explored in a safe environment. Freedom of speech is a right that is fundamental to both higher education and American democracy. But what is free speech? Free speech allows me to speak my mind. Free speech means that our campus includes diverse thoughts and opinions. Free speech allows for healthy dialogue. Free speech includes hate speech, which unfortunately can be hurtful. Free speech allows us to peacefully protest when we disagree. Free speech must be protected for everyone.
so that our campus continues to be a place that includes diverse perspectives. Where we can speak our minds freely. Peacefully protest. Engage in healthy dialogue. And where it's okay to have differences of opinion. As Titans committed to the marketplace of ideas, free expression, free speech, and perhaps most importantly, the freedom to disagree, we recognize that the ability to express differing viewpoints and engage in civil discourse is integral to our university's mission, vital to student learning, and fundamental to the tenets of our nation's democracy. As such, free speech deserves our attention and our protection. So thank you. Thank you for upholding these values and peacefully challenging speech and behavior that while protected may not align with your views or our vision of inclusive excellence. Your words and actions and your dedication to the principles of free expression inspire me and all Titans to continue to reach higher. So these are the resources that we used um, during our presentation today. So I wanted to include that in case you have any questions. And that is the end of our presentation. Do 